godly sorrow worketh repentance. Genuine spiritual mourning for sin is the work of the Spirit of God. Repentance is to choice a flower to grow in nature's garden. Pearls grow naturally in oysters, but penitence never shows itself in sinners, except divine grace works it in them. If thou hast one particle of real hatred for sin, God must have given it thee, for human nature's thorns never produced a single fig. That which is born of flesh is flesh. True repentance has distinct reference to the Savior. When we repent of sin, we must have one eye upon sin and another upon the cross, or it will be better still if we fix both our eyes upon Christ and see our transgressions only in the light of his love. True sorrow for sin is eminently practical. No man may say he hates sin if he lives in it. Repentance makes us see the evil of sin, not merely as a theory, but experimentally. As a burnt child dreads fire, we shall be as much afraid of it as a man who has lately been stopped and robbed is afraid of the thief upon the highway. And we shall shun it, shun it in everything, not in the great things only, but in little things, as men shun the little vipers as well as the great snakes. True mourning for sin will make us very jealous of our tongue, lest it should say a wrong word. We shall be very watchful over our daily actions, lest in anything we offend. And each night we shall close the day with painful confessions of shortcoming, and each morning awaken with anxious prayers, that this day God would hold us up that we may not sin against him. Sincere repentance is continual. Believers repent until their dying day. This dropping well is not intermittent. Every other sorrow yields to time, but this dear sorrow grows with our growth. And it is so sweet a bitter that we may thank God we are permitted to enjoy and to suffer it until we enter our eternal rest. Love is as strong as death. Whose love can this be, which is as mighty as the conqueror of monarchs, the destroyer of the human race? Would it not sound like satire if it were applied to my poor, weak, scarcely living love to Jesus my Lord? I do love him, and perhaps by his grace I could even die for him. But as for my love in itself, it can scarcely endure a scoffing jest, much less a cruel death. Surely it is my beloved's love, which is here spoken of, the love of Jesus, the matchless lover of souls. His love was indeed stronger than the most terrible death, for it endured the trial of the cross triumphantly. It was a lingering death, but love survived the torment, a shameful death, but love despised the shame, a penal death, but love bore our iniquities, a forsaken lonely death, from which the eternal Father hid his face. But love endured the curse, the gloried over all. Never such love, never such death. It was a desperate jewel, but love bore the palm. What then, my heart, hast thou no emotions excited within thee at the contemplation of such heavenly affection? Yes, my Lord, I long, I pant to feel thy loving flaming like a furnace within me. Come thou myself, and excite the ardor of my spirit. For every drop of crimson blood thus shed to make me live, oh, wherefore, wherefore have not I a thousand lives to give? Why should I despair of loving Jesus with a love as strong as death? He deserves it, I desire it. The martyrs felt such love, and they were but flesh and blood. Then why not I? They mourned their weakness, and yet out of weakness were made strong. Grace gave up all their unflinching constancy. There is the same grace for me, Jesus, lover of my soul, shed abroad such love, even thy love in my heart this evening.